Hello and welcome back to the Gold Newsletter channel. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the Ed J.R. Mining Guy on Twitter and your host for this discussion today. As you know, I'm hosting this channel together with our good friend Brian London. And the whole point is to introduce interesting companies that we've come across and introduce them to a wider audience, of course. Today, I've invited Prismo Metals and I'll be joined in a few short seconds by their executive chairman and their exploration advisor, Peter McGaw. And we're, we're going to dive into some specifics. Where's the project? Why is it of interest and uh, why has it been overlooked? What are the next steps, of course, as well? And uh, we hope to, you know, ask questions that are useful and insightful to you as well. And uh, if, if you find this conversation of value, please hit that subscribe button, leave a comment, leave a like as well, because we do want to hear from you. We're not just doing these interviews just for sheer joy and fun. Of course, we want you to take something away from it. And if we do get some constructive criticism, of course, as well, we'll, we'll try to incorporate it and make it as much as or as useful as possible. Now, without much further ado, let me introduce the gentleman here on the screen, Alain Lambert, Executive Chairman, and Peter McGaw, the Exploration Advisor. Gentlemen, it's great to have you on. Thank you so much for joining me yeah it's a pleasure hi thank you kai oh absolutely yeah no let's uh, let, let's dive right in Allah, let's uh, let's start with a bit of a company introduction give us a 30 60 second uh, 35 000 foot overview here of prismo metals and of course we'll dive into specifics right after that's great well thanks for uh, for having us kai so uh in addition to being the executive chairman i'm one of the co-founders of the company uh we're an exploration uh company with three projects two in mexico one in Arizona, and, and um, the one in Arizona is probably the one that we want to focus on, Copper Project, right in the heart of the very famous uh, Arizona Copper Belt. But we also have two other uh, projects in Mexico, as I was saying. One is a gold prospect called Los Pavitos, uh, very large acreage in Sonora State, uh, orogenic gold prospect in nature. Uh, we've been drilling it for um, uh, last year. We started our first campaign there with great success. And our other project in um, in uh, Mexico is uh, called Palos Verde Silver in the famous Panuco district. We're surrounded by one of our uh, strategic investors, Vizla Silver. We've had several campaigns, drilling campaigns. We'll be drilling it again uh, this year. And as it relates to uh, to hot breccia, the copper prospect in um, in uh, Arizona, we're awaiting the uh, the drilling permit. We um, we're sort of an old school company. We've got a tight share structure for about forty point eight million shares. Outstanding management uh, advisors and and. Um, Founders, we still own 28%, uh, 28.1% of the company after being public four years and raising in excess of $7 million. And uh, with that, uh, I turn it over to you again, Kai. No, fantastic. No, I appreciate the introduction. You already took away my second question, which our audience knows is always about cap structure. Um, let, let's get a little more granular. If you could run us through that a lot real quick, uh, what does it look like? And uh, maybe break down some of the shareholders as well. Yes, absolutely. So out of 40.8 million shares outstanding, um, so myself, uh, our CEO, our board members, and, and Peter as an advisor, and his group in Mexico, we own 28% uh, of the shares. Vizla Silver <coughs> owns 9.9%. They uh, did a $2 million financing <coughs> into our company back in uh, January 2023. Um, and the reason being is, uh, as I said, Palos Verdes is one of our uh, silver projects. They we're surrounded by them and uh, we uh, are going to be doing more exploration. Hopefully one day that property is going to be acquired by, uh, by Vizsla. Uh, our float is about 19 million shares outstanding, uh, nine of which is uh, with one broker, an old friend of mine at Haywood Securities. I've been known and been doing business with him since the early 90s 91 to be uh, more precise so he's got nine million shares on the books started out when he took the company public for us he did the initial public offering and he's participated for his clients uh, in all of our financing so as i said we're pretty old school we we like to own a lot of stock ourselves and and very strong ownership by uh, strategic investors and and friends of ours no, fantastic. And to Peter, you're a large shareholder, I understand, as well in the company. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I have a significant holding myself, but um, 
the bigger holding is actually in the hands of my Mexican corporate uh, associates in uh, Hermosillo. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, but before we talk hot breach, I really want to quickly want to talk Palos Verdes just just for a brief second because you brought it up, uh, Alain, as well. Like, what what is that relationship with Vigilant Silver right now? Uh, how are they also involved in the exploration efforts? Yes. Yeah, so I'll give you the background, and then I think it's worth uh, Peter um, saying a few words on the district. But uh, so we we are uh, qualifying property when we went public, Palos Verdes. Um, is in the Panuco district, and then Mike Connor and his group at Vizla assembled the, the whole Panuco district for the first time in its history, and they made uh, some significant discoveries. A part of the district they have not yet focused on is the one where we're at, which is in the northeast side, although they surround us in three different ways. And uh, so we approached uh, Vizla last year and 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 suggested they invest we used the dollars that they gave us to explore that part of the district and we also created uh, together a technical committee which is comprised of our ceo craig gibson jesus villador who's vpx at uh, visla and and peter and so maybe peter can tell us a little bit more about that committee um, yeah, actually, I'll be going down next week for our first meeting of 2024. Um, it's Craig and I, Jesus and um, uh, uh, Oscar, the geologist, uh, the other Oscar um, geologist there at, uh, at Panuco. Um, I've been working in the district since the early 80s. Um, it's a wonderful classic Mexico style high grade epithermal vein system. We have 750 meters of what looks like a, an emerging important vein in the district. And so we're, we're drilling it and we're working with them sort of to understand how the district fits together, uh, which is my general approach to exploration. I like district plays, high grade, where you can control the whole thing. And in this particular case, Vizsla controls most of it. Uh, and as Elan mentioned, the ultimate goal is for them to control all of it. Fantastic, yeah, especially since they have a say in the exploration as well, due to the technical committee as well. Yeah. So they, they know what's going on. So fantastic. Uh, any any last words on Palos Verdes? Is that uh, what, what are the plans for this year then? Um, is that what you're uh, going to discuss down in Mexico this year then, Peter, or next week? Sorry. Yeah, we'll be discussing the the plans going forward. We have a drill program for Palos Verdes where we'll be drilling some holes deeper on the vein. All the indications are that we're very high in the overall zoning. So we want to get some holes in deeper, and those will be drilled off of Isla property. Oh, okay, so fantastic, sir! You're actually stepping out on their ground to to drill. So yeah, that's just where the the, the collar of the hole will be on their ground, and then the hole will go into ours. Okay, interesting, fantastic, awesome. Um, I think we can put a bow around Palos Verdes because uh, I think we really want to talk about hot breccia and what what the plans are, uh, uh, you know, moving forward. But uh, let's start with a bit of the history of the project in in Arizona. Um, maybe Peter or Alan is like, uh, I'll leave it up to you. Uh, who who wants to jump in here? But uh, what what is the history of the hot breccia project? Well, hot breccia is another property that's been around for quite a while. Uh, it's literally across the highway from the hi historic Christmas mine. Uh, which was operated by Asarco, I believe, for many years. Uh, it now belongs to Freeport, uh, and they've expanded the resource there very substantially. Uh, Hot Breach itself sits on the other side of a porphyry copper intrusive complex. Uh, there were some holes put into it back in the 60s and 70s, um, and they got some pretty good results out of those holes, <clears throat> but it wasn't immediately big enough or high enough grade for what you needed back in those days. Uh, it's actually remarkably high grade by today's standards. Um, and it's one of these properties that sort of fell by the wayside and, and a gentleman named Linus Keating, who had worked as a geologist for Kennecott, uh, got a hold of the core, was able to look at it back when he was working for them in the 80s, was really impressed by what he saw sort of kept his eyes on the claims. And when the claim package came free, um, he picked it up. <clears throat> and so we've acquired it from him. Uh, we've acquired the historic data, but not the historic core. It has, the historic core has been discarded. Uh, we're putting it back on its feet with modern understanding of porphyry copper systems and the recognition that 
what the very high level manifestations of a really big porphyry copper could look like. Uh, we're just down the road, almost in sight of resolution where a huge discovery was made by tracking relatively small surface showings ultimately all the way down into one of the world's great porphyry deposits. We are in sight of the Ray mine. If there wasn't a hill in the way, we could see Morenci. Uh, we are inside of the Hayden smelter. So we're on Main Street as far as big porphyry coppers go in Arizona. And we're seeing a lot of signs that say there's a big system there at Hot Breccia. Why was it ignored until today? Like uh, maybe let, let's <clears throat> dive a bit into history there as well. Like um, it seems like there's a bit of a re re renaissance happening there, of course. So wh why now? Well, a lot of why now has to do with the price the price of copper and the demand for copper has gone up very substantially as a as a geologist who has lived through a couple of copper cycles um you know during the 80s when copper was well under a dollar a pound uh there wasn't a lot of exploration going on it went up a bit in the 90s and then cratered again uh, interest has been building uh, but in the course of that period of time, you've seen massive consolidation of the copper space. So the, the copper industry has gotten more and more concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. Uh, those companies need bigger and bigger deposits for things to look like they make sense to them. Um, so they've, and, and just because of the historic environmental situation in the U.S., uh, a lot of those companies fled to South America, Asia and places like that where they thought things were were easier to operate and now with the recognition that copper is a critical metal uh, support from the US government to advance copper projects uh, this brings this very firmly back onto the front burner absolutely let's talk about political risk because you're in Arizona of course so and we all know it can be hit and miss in Arizona as well so tell us a bit more about you know project location and uh, per permitting in particular as well well we are across the highway from a, an existing mine. It's mothballed at the moment, but Freeport is expanding the resource. I believe they're planning on putting it back into production sooner or later. Um, there has been a recent judgment uh, that allows resolution to move forward. Uh, so that particular roadblock um, has been eliminated, which suggests that the overall environment for moving projects forward in Arizona um, is getting better. Same thing with South 32 down in Patagonia. Uh, we're not in Forest Service. We're on BLM property. Um, so we're expecting that the permitting will be pretty straightforward. Yeah, I uh, know you mentioned at the beginning that uh, you've applied for a drill permit. And uh, as, as, as you know, Peter mentioned, do you see any hurdles, any, any additional hoops you need to jump through, or is it just pretty much a straightforward process? In the case of Prismo, we were following a, a a very specific application process, which is called a notice of intent to to drill, and 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 that's uh, as a result of the fact that there are existing roads on our property and and old drilling pads, and and our plan is to, if you if you will, to use uh, layman's term, kind of repermit those roads and and drilling pads. And as part of the process, we will not disturb more than five acres um, of the environment. And and if you, as a company, are able to do that, um, then the, the 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 permit is streamlined, if you will. So um, so we're optimistic that in late April, early May, we'll we'll have that in hand, and we'll put some uh, some backhauls and kind of you know uh, level off some of the roads, and we'll be ready to go. No, fantastic. Um, we, we all know drilling is usually the last step in, in the exploration process. Um, run me a bit through the targeting, Peter, as well. Like, how have you identified the targets, or is it really that simple? There is a malachite. Let's drill into that. <laughs> well, there is malachite, so to some degree, it's that simple. But <clears throat> what hot breccia is is an enormous breccia pipe. So this is a an intrusive system that, for want of a better term, burped in the late stages of its development. So there was a pressure release and fragments were entrained into this body of, of uh, this breccia body, which just means broken rock, but it was an it was a very forceful and 
emplacement. Uh, we see fragments of rocks that are at least a kilometer below the surface. So there was a lot of vertical transport that tells you it was a very energetic system. And that breccia has brought up fragments of mineralized scarn. It's brought up fragments of mineralized intrusion. Um, and these sit on the surface in the breccia matrix and they weep malachite, as you say. So where the thing is, is pretty easy. Uh, we know to a certain degree where it is at depth because there were some drill holes that went in back in the 70s uh, that got down sort of to the top of the system. We think the main system lies deeper than that. So we've done a lot of detailed mapping and sampling of the fragments and understand which units the, the fragments in the breccia came from. Uh, and at the same time, we've done uh, AMT and magnetic geophysics, which we've processed and we have a an anomaly at depth that, that is what you would expect a deep porphyry to look like. And I, it, I, it's a little misleading to say deep because all of the work has been done basically from the top of the hills and ground level is 350 meters lower. So um, it, you may have to drill into it from the top of the hill, but you don't necessarily have to mine into it from the top of the hill. Gotcha. Um, and you recently... Re oh. So I was going to, yeah, if you don't mind, Kai, I'd like to add something. I'm uh, So something that I'm passionate about, and maybe your viewers uh, should know, my, my background is uh, law and finance. I'm not a geologist, but I'm very passionate in, in answering your questions. So in terms of the uh, drilling program at Hod Brecha, just like in any of our other project, I always sit down um, with our, our team. And I remember a recent dinner in Tucson with Peter, our CEO, Craig Gibson, and one of our advisors on our breach, Steve Robertson. And what I'm interested about is always the same thing. What, in terms of drilling or any kind of exploration, what makes geological sense or makes the most geological sense? I mean, what that plan is, and that's what we're going to communicate with the investors. And sometimes investors, you got to explain why you're doing things in a certain way because they have become conditioned to um, ask a result and 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 do their own interpretation of these results when uh, a lot of these people are just not qualified to do that. So, so we're going to do what the technical team decides. Um, I heard Peter say that maybe the first hole is is one where you go deep and try to find where you are in in, in the system and all all the components of it. And uh, and it's not going to necessarily be the you know the hole that's going to set the world on fire. But if from a geological standpoint, that's what we need to do. That's what we're going to do. No, fantastic. I appreciate you clarifying that as well, because um, it makes sense. Because uh, as, as you said, the market is always greedy for the hundred meters of ten percent copper, right? <laughs> or the fourteen hundred meters of what is it, one point five percent? So, um, w which is fantastic. But uh, not every drill hole can be that. So, um, but I know like, uh, you, you put out some highlights from assays just uh, recently as well. Like, and maybe Peter, um, you can put some context around those assay results. Uh, Five point six nine percent of copper, uh, where I assayed there. Like, uh, what, what does that tell you? So, so those assays come off <clears throat> fragments from the breccia. So the the breccia has done the sampling for us at depth, <laughs> brought these pieces up to the surface. Uh, we sample those, and those tell us that there's mineralization of that style and grade somewhere at depth. And so because of the range of styles of mineralization we're seeing everywhere from mineralized intrusion to mineralized scarn to what may actually be oxidized, massive uh, sulfide mineralization, we may be looking at the full spectrum that we expect to see where a porphyry copper is emplaced into limestones. So that gives you the mineralized porphyry itself, the scarn, which is the reaction between early fluids coming off the intrusion and the limestone, and then the mineralization, the copper mineralization, which overprints the scarn and extends outward and attacks the limestone. So you know, the, an extreme example or a really good example of the CRD or the replacement style of mineralization is the Taylor Monto, uh, just south of us here in Tucson. Um, Scarn, <coughs> excuse me, scarn and porphyry uh, is actually what resolution is. A lot of the big high grade shell at resolution is scarn, um, very well mineralized, as, as is the intrusion, but the, the bulk of the high grade at resolution is in the scarn. So 
given the fact that we're very close to resolution in Morency, which has a lot of characteristics that are very similar uh, to resolution, we're hoping that we're in that sort of style and size family. No, oh, fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, that's giving some perspective, uh, uh, of course, as well, uh, and and frame like expectations to a degree as well, right? So um, fantastic. Um, I'll, I'll ask, like to sort of frame and, and wrap up the conversation here as well, like from from a company side, what are, what are the next steps? What can we expect in next announcements from, from Prisma Metals here? Yeah, so, so we're going to be active this year on the three properties. So for Los Pavitos, the Gold Prospect in Sonora State, we're going to do some geophysics and help us identify future drilling targets for the second half of this year. Um, we're about to embark on the next drilling campaign at uh, Palos Verdes, the one that uh, Peter mentioned, where we're going to be drilling off of uh, Vizla's property. And then uh, we're hoping to get the, the permit for Hot Breccia end of April, early May. Uh, there will be continuing assay results coming out of there because uh, we have a lot of boots on the ground. I'm actually uh, going there in, a two, in, in two weeks. The whole team's going to be there on a two-week campaign. So we'll be releasing these, uh, as, um, these results as they come available. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. No, it's, it's, it sounds like a really busy season ahead of you, gentlemen. And uh, really looking forward also to the site visit we have planned later this uh, or later next month. April. So later in April. So really looking forward to that as well. Fantastic. Um, really appreciate the company introduction. I think it was really comprehensive. Of course, now uh, we'll, we'll catch up, talk more geology once some more drill results and other um, drill plants become available. So we'll definitely have you back on, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Gold Newsletter channel. Uh, I'm hosting this channel together with our good friend, uh, friend Brian London. And if you like the discussion, please leave a like, leave, uh, leave a subscribe as well. And uh, did you get something out of this? This is really important to us. Uh, did, did you learn something? Is this of interest? Did we ask the right question? Of course as well keep it keeping in mind this is a company introduction but but let us know constructive criticism always helps us frame the conversations and help us and help you make better investors and better investment decisions as well keep in mind this is not investment advice this is just educational content of course so with that uh we'll be back with lots more here on the channel thank you so much for joining us